19 hit and Wilberforce University, you was receiving a lot of free laptops, hotspots, and all the other technology needs to make sure that you enhance your education at the university. That was by Dominion Energy. Dominion Energy has also looked at the opportunity of sponsoring some of our enhancing some of our academic programs. The Honored, happy to be here. What a great opportunity we have today. First of all, I want to give a round of applause to the students here and virtually, because many of us, uh, being here, you made a decision. We all know some of the hardships we have in our communities. You made a decision to be a student, when in some cases you may you should have been working. Appreciate your presence here today, and that's why I wanted to be an advocate uh, for this type of program. Um, what I'll do before we get to the important guest here, Ms. Chappelle, I want to give you a little introduction to Dominion Energy. I know we have a few slides. Um, Dominion Energy is based out of Richmond, Virginia. So most of you probably have never heard of Dominion Energy until this program. Um, in 2020, when we all were, we've been aware of some of the social injustices taking place in this country. But in 2020, it was an opportunity for the corporate community across the country um, to show their empathy, their engagement in our communities um, and Dominion, and I'm proud to work for Dominion that we took, we were motivated to have an impact in the communities in which we serve. So actually for us in Ohio, Dayton is not in our service territory, but with there being two HBCUs here in Dayton, it was an opportunity to be impactful. As you see from the slide, Dominion Energy resides in 16 different states. We have over 7 million customers. Let's put that in perspective. And over 17,000 employees. So I hope when you see this slide, you see opportunity. That's part of this, this, this lecture series. Yes, you want to hear from our esteemed speakers, but our sponsorship should also be a reminder. There's opportunity across this country in companies like ours for you to aspire 
or make sure you reach your aspirations in a professional setting. Next slide. So I mentioned 2020. Uh, it was motivation to reinforce what we need to do in the corporate community, diversity and inclusion. Have an impact in the communities you serve. Make certain that your workforce represents the communities that you serve. And I think many of my partners in the corporate community would acknowledge that that has not been the case. I'm proud that Dominion is making an effort to change that narrative. You're going to hear me say it quite often today in my five minutes, Ms. Cole. Um, change that narrative. Uh, next slide. So our, our mantra at Dominion Energy, uh, actions speak louder. That's why I'm here today. I took the three-hour drive, first time in Wilberforce, so happy to be here. But I felt for this type of program, a video wasn't appropriate. I wanted to share our message, introduce you to our company. Post lecture, I want you to check out our company on the web, on our website. It's opportunities, the career options at a company like Dominion Energy. Next slide. So I keep referencing 2020. I'm not acting as if 2020 is when social injustice was initiated. We're all aware that this has been the case for years upon years, but it was an opportunity, uh, unfortunately, because many of those incidents were caught on tape or video that some empathy formed in the corporate community. So you see the 11 schools. These are the schools that reside within our service territory. So Dominion in 2020, you can go to the next slide, committed $25 million. And let, let's, let's clap our hands for that, $25 million. Um, to HBCU. And the goal there, one, there was a need and it's our corporate duty to have a positive impact and to have engagement with these schools that do not have the resources that the PWRs have. Also, as we try to improve our workforce, an improved workforce equates to a diverse workforce. This is our opportunity to reach out to these schools, give them um, grants to address the needs that schools may have. But then the part where I come in, I'm vice president of our technical services company. Um, I have an opportunity to impact how we hire. In addition to the 25 million, we have an additional 10 million associated with scholarships, internships. So my challenge today before I hand the mic over to Ms. Chappelle Please, for you to change the narrative, you have to be proactive. There's scholarships, there's internships. I actually have six internships that will be posted next week. I want to see Wilberforce students apply. Change the narrative, but you have to be proactive. There's opportunities out there. It's not just, just about cutting the check. If it was about cutting the check, I wouldn't have made this drive. I want to put a face on the name for Dominion. I wanted to support this great lecture series. Get to meet Ms. Chappelle. Um, this is what it's all about. When you're in a position, as I've been blessed to be in, to impact change in the community that looks, that you serve, but also these are faces that I don't typically see in the boardroom. To come here and see this diverse audience, it motivates me that I have to keep grinding but I also need to look behind and see who I can bring in the next generation. So I'll get off my soapbox. Proud to be here, happy to be here. Look forward to the, the discussion today. Please, Dominion Energy, do your research, but be proactive with applying for these scholarships. Be proactive applying for these internships. Okay? Thanks, Ms. Cole. Well, I'm sure you can see his passion. And I will just say, you know, I have the pleasure of working with a lot of our corporate partners. And I have yet to find one really as passionate as Mr. McCoy. He has gone into his space. He has disrupted that space. He is truly carrying the legacy and the spirit of Bayard Rustin with that angelic disruption. And we are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to welcome Alexander, who's going to come on up and introduce us to our speakers. So, Mr. Alexander Murphy.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing it is to be here today. I'm Alexander Murphy, the vice president of the Student of Government Association here at Wilberforce University. And on behalf of them, I welcome you all in peace this morning. And normally we start off with a quote. And I think as Black History Month is coming to an end and given the historical importance of this week, I think it's appropriate that the quote that we have here today is one by the late, great Malcolm X. We declare our right on this earth to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, and this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. Now today, we have an amazing woman who will be speaking to us, Miss Felicia Chappelle, who is a writer and actress based in Yellow Springs, Ohio, so she is a native here. She partners with Will Walker Faith Productions to enlighten and entertain around issues of mental, emotional, and behavioral health awareness. The excerpt she has selected to mirror her presentation is example, I'm sorry, is an example from her podcast, Faces on the Train. We welcome you today. And we can we are excited to hear what it is you have to say and teach us. Thank you. Undiagnosable disorder. The only living food function a shadow into a vivid thing. And she can't escape. She is like Alice with the tea. And she sees herself as innocent. Vivian is trying to erase the day she was born. She is trying to share the mild business that none of us Excuse me. One moment, we have a little technical difficulty. Thank you, everyone. I just took it out. I pulled it up. Well, yeah, it should be. Oh, no, that's good. This has to come out? That's going to be for the video. She's like Alice. And the mic, the audio. Mm -hmm. Really, this is trying to erase the stage. She was so what I'd like to do is just play through the computer again. Play through the computer? Yeah. Because this was plugged in. It's not playing up there. Oh, no, yeah, because the audio is going to the projector. Walking through the world on this, Vivian feels like a wild banshee with an unsheathed machete. She is miniature. I heard it coming out of that. The 
classified as a disease. Vivian is dressed in blue. She is a molecule, but surrounded by thicker than water red. She is swimming uphill, cutting through obstacles. Helmet's coming out of the speaker. You just gotta give it more volume. Undiagnosable disorder. Yeah, tell him. The anger, vivid. Undiagnosable disorder. The anger Vivian is digesting has shot her into a vivid fantasy that she cannot escape. She is like Alice with the tea cake and she sees herself as very small. Vivian is trying to erase the day she is having. She is trying to shed the mire of isms that mummify her mood. She wants her beautiful complexion and her rich, soulful spirit. She wants to step out of the warped frame of skin as seen by hateful minds. Walking through the world on Wednesday, Vivian feels like a wild banshee with an unsheathed machete. She is miniature and trapped inside the veins and arteries of a healthy, racist, white man. Racism is not classified as a disease. Vivian is dressed in blue. She is a molecule, but surrounded by thicker than water red. She is swimming uphill, cutting through obstacles. Vivian is high cholesterol, a clot, an aneurysm, and a lethal bubble of air. Vivian is a heart attack, a murmur, liver disease, and indigestion. She is an unassimilated pulled pork barbecue, setting worms loose into Ethan Roberts' system. Vivian is mad and she enters him through his nostrils. She is fighting racism inside his circulatory system. Vivian is lymph poisoning. She is pus on every wound, acne, and picked scab. She is a pulsating fistula on a junkie or a dialysized elder with no kidneys. Ethan slithers into her cubicle, presses on the back of Vivian's chair, and reads over her shoulder. Each one of these things is individually annoying, unacceptable. She is tolerating the intolerable. Can you hear me? Fantastic. On behalf of Wilberforce University and their generous corporate sponsor, Dominion Energy, it is my pleasure to deliver the keynote address for this year's Bayard Rustin Lecture Series. Now, you'll have to forgive my very formal nature. Let's take a moment to acknowledge all the people who helped us, starting with Dr. Pinkert, Natalie Coles, the supporting staff, everybody who assisted today, and my grandfather, the departed Mr. Henry Talmadge Chappelle, who graduated from Wilberforce from the class of 1938. <laughs> Opportunities do not happen because of determination alone. Can I get a little volume on this mic? Will and determination are important components of a more sophisticated machine. And I am here and hope to gain all of us from this experience. So I will gain from this and you will gain from this. I'm happy to be here 
And I know that many strong-willed individuals made it possible for me to be here, and I'm well aware of the obstructions. And I'm well aware of the resilience. And for the resilience, we thank God. For the first time in recorded human history, mankind is having a group response to a singular concern. Through access to the whole world community, during the age of technological rule, the fact that nearly every household on earth responds to the same disruption is revealed in tangible and clear evidence. We have unequivocal access to one another. No portion of this world has gone untouched by this strange occurrence that has held our captive attention for almost two solid years. Every head that lays itself to rest at night has at some point contemplated concerns of health and survival. None of us would have intentionally sought these challenges. It is not our habit to say, what can I do to dismantle and rebuild my psyche? What can I do to disrupt my stability so that I can grow? We generally do not do that. Residents on every continent has been, have been affected by unanticipated and major change. And we've learned a lot about ourselves and the people close to us. Most of these lessons have been of isolation and confinement. COVID-19 has rattled the cages of our daily life, rearranging the norms almost overnight. Are you guys with me? Is everybody still with me? All right. This is the 2022 Bayard Rustin Angelic Disruption Lecture Series. So before I go any further, I want to adapt what is called a consensus reality, something we can all agree upon. And that consensus reality is the premise which will, with, with which we will move forward. And the consensus reality is this. As residents in and citizens of the United States of America, during these times, we are leaders, even if we only must gain mastery over ourselves. So today I'd like to orient your thinking around three questions. Who am I? Knowledge of self, who am I? How much energy do I have? And how do I intend to apply it? We will look at these questions to learn more about leadership and we will start with Bayard Rustin because he was a beacon of light positioned to re remain in the shadows of other men. And we thank him today for his angelic disruption. It's difficult to stand on the wings of progress no matter how sturdy they are, no matter how far they extend. When the hopeful fly toward the sun, it is challenging to tolerate the heat on the path of social change. Bayard Rustin was a tremendous and under-celebrated force in the civil rights movement. He was a humble orchestrator of the many freedoms that we now enjoy. Rustin was a strategist and his mind held applicable solutions to the question, how? Just like this guy from Dominion today gave us answers to how. He gave us six internship openings for energy. That is a how. Bayard Rustin was a thinker among thinkers. And though our nation falls short of achieving the visions of this man and those of his colleagues, much of our uplifting qualities of life can be directly traced to Rustin's actions and the actions of others around him, both male and female, sung and unsung. His leadership, legis legis le uh, his leadership legacy, it started in this institution of higher learning. It was right here where his young manhood was shaped and we can be grateful and we can be proud. The honest truth of his having been met with resilience, resistance, while studying here at Wilberforce University, we must also face that truth. Bayard Rustin's time at Wilberforce ended, as we know, in expulsion. 
This is an ironic consistency in the face of history. He was organizing a protest against something unacceptable, something here that he had campus supporters for, and his leadership was challenged by school authorities and the institution decided they could not support his disruption. For the man, who he was did not change, but he received his first hard lesson. The rejection of the administration of 1934 when he was expelled, having only completed two years of study. So again, we're here, we're glad to be here, we're grateful to be here, and we have to pursue it passionately. Rustin continued striving to overcome oppression, eventually serving as lead organizer and chief advisor to the inner circle of the civil rights movement until he was indicted in a scandalous and highly publicized illicit event involving sexual behavior between consenting adults. That is what happened to him. To condemn Baird Rustin for the truth of his identity is nothing less than ridiculous atrocity. The crime he was prosecuted for in the state of California was an application of selective morality. If the objective was to use legislation in support of upright moral behavior, this was a clear falsehood. Bodies were heinously sexualized brutally and routinely in the country. Was his quote unquote crime that he was gay? So his inner life was used to destabilize his effectiveness? Also wrong. Baird was condemned by his oppressors to undermine his importance, by his personal companions, which served to reinforce a sense of shame and condemned by colleagues who wanted to be distanced from public humiliation. And he was condemned by himself because Baird Rustin did not want to be in front of the movement and ostracized for being a gay man. And his fellow leaders did not want to support him. Rustin was socially criminalized because he was involved in reckless folly that led to his entrapment by operatives who, for fun, intentionally blemished his ability to function as a liberation specialist in America's fight against the worst of herself. Okay, so let me go away from this for just a minute and um, discuss a few more details before I continue. It's important to note that Dr. King was not demonized for his womanizing. Neither was he publicly demonized for his infidelity. The scrutiny into these issues was only used to destabilize Coretta Scott King. It was not used to destabilize him in his community. It was not used to destabilize him in the movement. Infidelity was so effective in causing rifts in family life that institutions that gathered this data did not intentionally, did not initially intend to use it at all. This narrative was a weapon that was strategically leveraged against Coretta's strength and resilience to create disruption and insanity in the King home and to unbalance the leader from the inside. This information was later used to tarnish King's image as it gained strength and influence over younger generations. This is why we must absolutely possess knowledge of self so that the things which we hold shame around and we all have those things, and the spaces in which we hold our vulnerability absolutely cannot be weaponized against us. Does everybody understand what I've said so far? Okay, I'm really grateful to have you active listeners. So when Bayard Rustin's sexual identity was exposed, the lateral leadership said, we cannot stand beside you. You've made it impossible for us to stand beside you. Now I have to stop again right here and go back to address a time of something that I remember from my childhood in the South, in the summer, something that was certainly the norm. There were many households with two men, male partners, best friends, double aunties. This was not strange to us. No one approached these subsets of our community with judgment or ostracization. When we went to these loved ones for Band-Aids, truth talks, 
dusting off iced tea and lemonade, period. Shame only shadowed our horizon when we became aware of the possibility of being accepted by the dominant culture. When we became aware of the possibility of inclusion, only then did we start to shamelessly discard our homosexual sons, our gay daughters, our neighbors, and our friends. And be mindful, Coretta said no. Coretta said, no, you're not gonna reject my comprehension of the sanctity that Dr. King and I have cultivated for our safety, our joy, our protection under the oppressive scrutiny of public watch. No, she said no. Coretta knew love was a sanctuary for protection. Martin Luther knew infidelity buffered the strain of probable assassination. Bayard Rustin knew homosexually was how he loved. The greatest achievements are most effectively built with the tools of introspection and self-awareness. So what does Felicia know about Felicia? And what do you students know about yourselves? You guys still here? Okay, good. I love young people. <laughs> Since we're talking about relationships, let's touch briefly on the Black American's relationship to the country of our birth. This relationship sadly mimics domestic abuse. So those of us who have unfortunately been exposed to domestic violence, take a, take a deep breath and stay with me. Those of you who have been exposed, those of us who have been exposed, know that perpetrators use violence, one, to aggressively express dark emotions that have not been processed. Perpetrators use violence because words fail them. Perpetrators use abusive words because emotions are painfully disorienting. Perpetrators use control because it is time consuming and strugglesome to train another victim to accept the abuse. Perpetrators use gaslighting to make their victims weak and self-doubting. Gaslighting is a term that needs to be defined. It's a term derived from a 1938 British stage play. It later went to film in that country and here in the US and the dramatic work was called Gaslight. And in Gaslight, a husband repeatedly refutes the wife's observation that the gas lantern appears to have been dimmed. This is very much the case, in fact. The lamp has been repeatedly dimmed, but his almost neurotic insistence mentally erodes the victim's ability to be certain of anything. To gaslight has come to mean a process by which one is deliberately driven insane by the psychological untruths and environmental, by psychological manipulation and environmental untruths. So things are presented as true when they are absolutely not true. And there's a term for it and it happens and it's real and our observation of it is valid. And it serves to convince the victim that they have totally lost their mind. The victim becomes fully distorted and confused after being exposed to these techniques. Gaslighting is when someone will hurt you and blame you for your feelings. Simply put, it is when reality is made not to exist. Abuse of this nature has very specific qualities and those qualities are not absent in the way America treats her black countrymen. We are in essentially an abusive relationship where the prevailing narrative is that we are very sensitive to something that does not exist. We are repeatedly insulted with the concept, racism is completely fabricated in our own imaginations. We, are, we continue to know that this is not correct. The standard line of the dominant culture is, we're not doing anything to you. And actually nothing's been done to you for a really long time. This distortion is one we do not accept because we know inside ourselves that it is not accurate. So how can I be secure in who I am? So that my convictions, my beliefs, my choices cannot be used as a weapon against me. So I have to be self-assured. I have to be secure. I have to tell myself that I matter 
I have to tell myself that my life has worth. Because when I get that messaging from inside of myself, my insecurities go away. My looking at other women or other people with darkness and with attitude goes away. Because I am self-informed, I am self-empowered, I believe in myself, and I will be able to recognize something in you. And if you're in pain, you will not shake me. And if you're empty inside, you won't shake me because I have knowledge of self. So if I do decide later in life to do something important and someone wants to remind me of some other way I was, am, or might have been, I can say, I know who I am right here, right now. And that cannot be weaponized against me. So with that solid self-awareness, we're free to uncover our potential and to have positive impact over the course of our lifetime. And this is the way that we identify and stay connected to a purpose. The human lifespan only has so many decades in it. From birth to death, the maturation process is a finite amount of time. And our joy will come from identifying how do we intend to apply ourselves. So we've talked about how much energy do we have and how do we plan to use it. And that'll give us the focus not to just start each day, not to get through till we can be in fellowship in worship or with our families, but we will be focused in purpose so that we know that our time is valuable. So that our lows are only so low and so we can bring ourselves down for our highs and we can stay on an even course forward in purpose. You had to make decisions about where you wanted to apply for, for college. You had to contemplate issues of identity and learn how do I make a decision. Then you had to set your priorities according to deadlines and requirements that you needed to be in compliance of to make your decision a possibility. You guys had to hustle to get here. You had to say, this is where I wanna go. This is how I'm gonna get here. This is how I'm gonna pay for it. You had to make effort and sacrifice. You had to galvanize, coordinate resources so that you could follow through on details that became an acceptance letter, a financial aid award packet. It led to your attendance into higher education at Wilberforce University. And that could not happen without your determination without you making a decision, and without you having had some knowledge of who you are. You made something important a reality. You decided where you wanted to be. So you brought a vision into fruition through action. And in the same way, when you see that pushback against the tide of racial oppression, you know that it is needed to be pushed back against. And in the climate of our nation, you have to make decisions about where you intend to apply your efforts because the amount of work far exceeds the amount of energy that any one of us will exert in a lifetime. So you wake up, you get dressed, all of us do, yet there are only so many hours in a day. So we analyze, we assess, we critique, we say what this particular individual or group or institution is not doing with their 24 hours a day while neglecting to focus on the use of our own 24 hours in a day. So we say things like, why don't they just, or I don't vote because that doesn't have anything to do with me, or the government is corrupt, or you know how they are, or those people never do anything for our communication, for our community. I'm not filling out the census. Why do they need to know my business? What they need to do is, and we go on and on and on like this. And those people have the same 24 hours in their day that I have in mine and that you have in yours. What they need to do, so we follow high profile personalities and we have a long list of ideas about their progress, their conduct, their product, their behavior, all of these things while failing to realize that we are them. We can structure our 24 hours toward greatness. We can participate in instead of spectate. Instead of watching our world go around, we have the capacity to be influencers and participate, and participate in excellence. And the question becomes, how do I gauge my personal energy to determine what I'm realistically cap uh, capable of accomplishing when I focus 
on a clear course of action. And I know this is gonna be a long speech, but I'm telling you for real, I'm gonna give you everything I have. <laughs> and maybe there'll be one shining star here. Maybe we'll each find a better place here to go forward. So I need to talk about the fact that we're all leaders. And that's kind of awkward because some of us are introverted, some of us are followers, some of us are looking for examples that were never set for us. Some of us look everywhere for examples and try to come up with some kind of fusion existence, but we're all leaders by default. And let me explain what I mean by that. Each one of us has to stand as an exemplary model of how to move in a world because there is no option where we are now to be ordinary and to secure basic necessities. You can't just be ordinary and be small and go through the course of life. There is way too much going on. So there's no successful course for us to naturally follow. And simple things have been obstructed, obstructed quite honestly, by systemic oppression that is unable to see itself. Taking the tools we've been given, the resources, the skills, the talents, one foot in front of the other, we make the way. We must move through the world on a road yet to be built past obstructions that have been littered throughout our experience and we're moving into a black future. So young people, your observations are valid when you say, it is not fair. Okay, it isn't fair. And your observations are valid when you have trouble navigating what older generations have laid out for you. And determining a way forward is itself an act of leadership. And we must be demonstrative. We must actually demonstrate humanity. We must be in order to be seen as human. If we are not demonstrative in the current climate, we will not be seen as human. So we must be demonstrative to be seen as human. As Americans, we are still negotiating with humanity and our right to be included in its fold. We'll need to conserve energy in this ongoing fight to establish that we are contributors. We are patriots. The flag belongs to us all. Our status as Americans is unbalanced by the stronghold racism has over the constitutional promises all countrymen are encouraged to seek. So the question becomes, how much energy do I have? How much energy do I have? How much energy do I have? How am I gonna use it? Published in the Western Journal of Medicine, medical doctor Alvin Francis Poussin in his article, Is Racism Mental Illness? writes, quote, the American Psychiatric Association has never officially recognized extreme racism as opposed to ordinary prejudice as a mental health problem, although the issue was raised more than 30 years ago. After several racist killings in the civil rights era, a group of black psychiatrists sought to have extreme bigotry classified as a mental disorder. The association officials rejected the recommendation, arguing that because so many Americans are racist, even extreme racism in this country is normative, a cultural problem rather than an indication of psychopathology. Mr. Poussaint goes on to say, Quote, to continue perceiving extreme racism as normative and not pathologic is to, is to lend it legitimacy. Clearly, anyone who scapegoats a whole group of people and seeks to eliminate them to resolve his or her own internal conflict meets the criteria of delusional disorder. And that is a major psychiatric illness. You guys still with me? Thanks for hanging in me. Thanks, I really appreciate y'all. Okay, so we failed to scientifically quantify extreme racism as a disease, okay? Nevertheless, the people afflicted with the disordered thinking around race have an objective, and this is very important. Their objective is to instigate, to irritate, to antagonize. It's pleasurable for them. And our emotional reactions is a joy for them. It is a powerful validation for the hater to turn a calm individual into a reactionary and hostile individual. These confrontations feel like accomplishments and accolades serving to offset the internal discomfort of low self-esteem. So racism is a thief. 
Is that clear? Okay. All right, so now I wanna talk about, um, I pulled something from social media because I know young people like social media. And so I visit it now so that I uh, can have a way to be connected to something that is obviously not going anywhere and is very different from what I was groomed on. But anti-abuse and wellness advocate in social media, Maria Conciello, she crusades against narcissism in love relationships. And on her page, she writes, it is extremely difficult to believe that people with no empathy exist. It's extremely difficult to believe people who cannot be emotionally attached or bond with anything. And it's the hardest thing to, to wrap your mind around, end quote. So let me ask this next question for your reflection. We get involved when we see racist encounters. Okay, we get angry and we get involved and we speak out. How could you? Don't you see? Why would you? Okay, and I'm not even gonna go there for real because we get really, really, really angry, all right? So let me ask you this. Is it reasonable to blow lungs full of air into a tirade against a stone cold heart? I'm trying to address the reaction we all tend to have when coming up against hostile, overt racism. Sometimes we scream, we yell, we cry to the heavens, we shout out loud at the faces of people who are completely incapable of hearing us. Know that. They do not hear us, okay? So I'm asking, I'm asking you and I'm asking myself, do I really want to take this living anger and this breath inside my body and blow it into the face of a rock that has absolutely no, zero, none ability to hear me? No, I don't want to do that. That is not energy I'm going to spend. When the Klan came to Dayton, I was not there. Do you see anything where there's going to be conflict? I myself, I will not be there because I am not gonna do that in my fifth decade with my energy. I'm not gonna do that. So I'm asking, if these qualities exist, and these are the qualities of a narcissist, and these are qualities of despicable monsters, this is the despicable monster called racism, and it continues to visit itself on the psyche of all Americans. This sickness does not affect us alone. This is a collective thing. We are all in this position. And at the core of it is shame. So therefore, when we try to overturn this thing that keeps coming from normal, that keeps us from normal activities that Americans expect to be able to pursue, at the core of it is shame. So we have to know ourselves. So we must, so that when we, come up against these things in others that we recognize this shame that is in us as well in our adversaries and there is balance here and it is hard work and it is your work because you have the comprehension it is my work because I have the comprehension you cannot explain to those whose ears are completely shut but there are those who will be present and get it wrong there are those who will show up and be offensive and be hurtful. They are in our streets, they're in our workplaces, they're in the places where we shop, we run into them at the grocery store, we will run into them. Some of them are even in my own family where I will be hurt and slighted in the sanctity of my own home by a family member who does not and will not understand my perception. So instead of being continually, aggressively hurt with the question, do you not understand? The answer is no, they do not. Knowledge of self is a shield against moral emptiness. And so we need a tool that says, I am not that. We need a clear boundary so when these things continually assault us, we can say, I am not that. Then I don't have to worry about her hair, her dress, her makeup, his lover, his hate, their baby mama, anybody else's mistakes. I don't have to worry about those. 
because I can say I am not that and I can make a decision about my agency, who I am, how much energy I have, and what I plan to do with it. And it takes focus. It's a science. Okay, so we're gonna go in another direction. Um, we're gonna go into the direction about between the two of us. Two being all of y'all and me. It's a strange kind of math that makes that two. If there's any mathematicians in the audience, you know, talk to me later about my math, but. I'll never know your level of comprehension until I test you. So I'll never know your capacity to understand what I'm saying if I don't speak to you. And this is an intergenerational issue and an intergenerational mistake that we make all the time. This is the language that elders and adults use that says, we don't understand your style of communication. We don't understand your style of dress. We don't understand your hair. We don't understand your taste in music. We don't understand your decisions about how you use your devices. We don't understand why you're spending your time like that. It's a communication that says that you don't see us as individuals. You think we were born elders. You imagine we've not had an aging process that's similar to yours. You imagine we've had no youth, no wild times, and we are completely not like you at all. So we don't see each other. We don't see each other, okay, intergenerationally. So I won't understand you and you won't understand me unless we enter into a dialogue. And entering into the dialogue is not the norm in this decade. It's something we have to be intentional about. We have to make a decision to enter that dialogue and it's an effort we have to make and we have to make it and your generation needs to be informed and my generation needs to be informed and we only can inform each other. I can't get this information from somewhere else. I have to go to you to get this information. You can't get my information from somewhere else. You have to come to me to get this information and it's wisdom that I might have that you might wanna borrow and it's information I need about how you're seeing things that will reinform me so that I can catch up, so I can let go of some stuff that will not be useful to how you're seeing things, and I can adapt some things that will be useful into how you are seeing things. And that is the best apology that I can give you for the world you find yourself in that I already moved through, that I have not done more to protect us all from. Does that make sense? Okay, I always apologize to my young people because I've been fighting really hard and y'all are watching and I've just gotten tired. And I've also gotten a little misdirected and I've gotten a little confused. But I am here, I've been here, and I need you to see me. I need you to see me. I do not need a single sigh that's like, oh, mom, I need you to see me. Alive, sane, sober, present, whatever it is I've become, I need you to see me. So think about that with your uh, professors, the old folks at home, or uh, any old folks, or even older, that you get to spend time with, have to spend time with, are able to spend time with. Okay, so, knowing myself will help me discover what can I reasonably, be, reasonably expect to accomplish? And this is less reactionary, more strategic, and more powerful. So I'm gonna talk about my property owning and my house and we're gonna get into some technical stuff real quick. Um, I say real quick. This is not gonna be a week of Sundays in one afternoon, I promise. Okay, so the house that I own is 10 minutes by car to the grocery store. Now for all the female audience participants, I need to let you know that of all the owned earth on the entire, all the owned property on the entire earth, only 20% globally has the name of a woman on the deed. So on my deeded piece of earth property, it's 10 minutes to the grocery store, okay? If I lived in the neighborhood directly on the west side of Dayton, Miami Valley, my daily provisions could not be secured with anything less than a 20 minute ride if I have transportation. And that little bit of time is a macro aggression. There's two kinds. Micro is the small one and macro is the big one. The house that I own and all of our real estate in general should be a convenient distance from where we secure our daily provisions. If not, we're being systematically disenfranchised. And to be clear, this is an example of a macro aggression. That amount of time takes time off of my life over the decades that I will live, okay? so. 
redlining is what it's called, and commercial real estate divestment. Divestment means to take the money and resources away. So redlining and commercial real estate divestment has made it such that our neighborhoods do not have a grocery store. And this is a direct attack on my quality of life, okay? It's my quality of life, it undermines my ability to take care of myself, it undermines my ability to take care of my loved ones, my family, my community, and this is called divestment. Because if the bank stops lending small businesses in our neighborhood, those businesses close. And I have to drive somewhere to get what I need. The property value goes down, the resale value of my house weakens, and then our taxes decrease. So, oh yay, no, because taxes are what we use to pay for public school. So if my house taxes now decrease, then the public school is less effective because public school is funded by property tax. And then the market value, what I get for the sale of my home has been driven down. So when our neighborhoods fail, developers take advantage of this low market value. They purchase all those homes. And that means that I've now relocated to far corners of neighboring country counties, neighboring cities, neighboring areas. Investors put all that money back into what used to be my neighborhood. And the house that they bought from me for $70,000 is now worth a quarter of a million dollars. And that's all before the next census count. It's called divestment, redlining, intentionally removing the wealth and resources from our neighborhoods so that they can be purchased and resold to developers who will make a half a million dollars over something that I will make less than $70,000 off of. That's what's going on. So, um, that's an example of a micro, a, a macro aggression. And that's different than somebody touching my hair. Okay. It all makes me mad, but that's completely different. Okay. That's a macro. That's big. A small one is called a micro. So if I'm sitting in an office space and someone um, commits a micro aggression against me, I'm feeling threatened. I have to negotiate emotionally inflamed parts of myself. I'm triggered by someone who does not have the experience or exposure to know that what they have said or done is not appropriate. Touching my hair is an example of a microaggression. So these are just examples, but somewhere in the range of these experiences, years are taken off of my life, trying to negotiate, tolerate, and explain race space, okay? So we need to take stock of our anger. I'm very angry, okay? I'm very angry and I have a very formal presentation style and I like to stick to my script because I am an angry person and I want to be approachable and I want to be multi-demographic and I want to have the ability to speak to as many people as openly as I can as often as possible. So we need to take stock of our anger and figure out where we are in the range of big and small offenses and decide how we are going to approach reorienting friends, neighbors, coworkers, and ultimately our countrymen into a more astute thinking around race. Stay with me. But it absolutely cannot exist in a hot spot. So whenever anything happens, I'm continually ignited, inflamed, angry, stressed, blood pressure, everything, engaging in conflict. I'm in a million different ways. You know what she said? I'm a million different places. Okay, I've lost my focus. Okay, and it happens to me too. So for this work, there's some things we are all gonna need. Strong sense of self and self-care habits. We're gonna need that. Suitable livelihood. We're gonna need to approach suitable livelihood. So when you're looking at your adulting, which you already are because you're in the institution, you're gonna need suitable livelihood. You're gonna be able to afford yourself. Men and women alike, I can afford myself at the degree of which I want to live. I can be a minimalist. I can be conservative. I can stack money and spend little. I can like to spend, I can get it and spend it. Whatever it is, I'm gonna need a livelihood to support what it is that my comfort zone is gonna be. And those needs can be secured and eased through higher education. I'm gonna to need to be loved and I'm gonna need loved ones in a community so as to be supportive and also to serve in rewarding relationships. But, in the most, but most importantly in this new social and political paradigm, we will need mental and emotional health because we are no longer a walk it off culture. We wanna look at the impact that these traumas have had. We're ready to look. We, wanna, we want to look at them, we wanna know them and we want them to go away. 
We don't want to just stand up, put on a face, make it all work. We want to know what's going on inside of ourselves. And the need to be seen as human is moving on to the surface. It's not just for idealists or misguided dreamers. It's not on the peripheral. It's not only seen as a privilege. We want to be seen, we want to be heard, and we want to feel good about ourselves from inside ourselves. I think that's what I noticed from y'all young people and what y'all look like y'all want, okay? And I want you to be sure to know that being mindful and being seen as human is not the same as seeking approval. And it certainly will not guarantee justice. But different cultures are having an absolutely different experience, okay? So as difficult as it is to acknowledge that our understanding of our understanding of race, this is hard to acknowledge. Our understanding of race is not the only perspective. So everything you know about what racism looks like and feels like to you, there are people who are equally convinced that our perspective is not accurate. And we don't have to spend all of our time saying that they're wrong. Trauma tells us, oh my God, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. Yes, they are wrong. Be clear that they are wrong. Now we need to start thinking about what does that look like? What does that feel like? And how does that pass through the minds of other people? We have to know what these thoughts and feelings are, where they come from, how these perceptions are developed so that we can figure out a way to unravel this maze. So um, within our communities, we must face this fact and shift our individual behavior accordingly. So there will be less time spent expecting other people to change and more time spent figuring out where am I. Now, other people do have to change, and I don't want to invalidate that. That is very real, and I'm not invalidating that in, the, uh, in any way. How likely is it that I can step myself, like we weren't able to very well hear the audio, but it's about a woman who steps out of herself and becomes kind of like a mist and enters her adversary and starts to wreak that same havoc that we have on the internal organs of her opponent. That's what the um, fictionalized piece was at the top that I tried to um, unleash on y'all. But that's what that's about. So we're gonna have to know what's going on around us so that we can better navigate basically. Um, so barring any, okay, so, um, I guess, I, I guess that's the fact that, and, and I just wanted to go on to say, I guess I'm, lo I'm losing myself because I'm getting emotional, but the world doesn't exist solely on our perception. So our perception is not the only thing that makes the world go around. Our observations and ideas are, are only one perspective. Okay. And barring physical handicaps, we're all given the same faculties with which to collect data. We have two eyes to see, two ears to hear, skin that senses through touch, we smell, we gather this data that's set before us. We take all this in. We're given the same world, though admittedly different vantage points. And inside the cranium of man is this fantastic organ that computes and deciphers all of this input. And we all have one. It's a human brain. It is gray matter. It is housed inside of the cranium. All of what informs it is something we all have. And this is the design of the human body. And we do not all agree. That's pretty amazing. Same input, same way to collect the data, same computer, and we obviously do not all agree. We have quite contrary, conflicting, and a wide range. And these are all conclusive findings. I conclude this, you conclude that, them, they, they, all of us conclude what our conclusion is, and we are not in agreement. We do not by any means agree. So when learning ways and the thought processes of our adversaries, we cannot afford to be wholly unable to imagine the point of view of this boisterous, unified, and antagonistic force. There are those who support this racism eagerly, passively, ignorantly, or otherwise, but it is worthy of our contemplation to differentiate one from the other. The one who touches the hair with fascination is not the one who makes an ignorant comment in error, is not the intentional bitter slight of envy, is not the organized systemic construct of redlining. So who is this they? 
Who is this day of whom we speak? Because these are all different things, and we're going to have to look at that. So when considering how to have impact and influence, the best way to conserve energy is to be willing to comprehend the ideology of the oppositional forces, then to develop and execute a plan. So an audience of great minds like y'all, you don't need me or anyone else to define for me your anger. You don't need my mind or anything like mine informing you of your hopes, your fears, or whatever else surrounds you that you are able to for yourself observe. And I'm only encouraging you to seek, to self-define and look for victory through action. Determine what action means to you. Take care of yourself. Update choices that do not serve your purpose. Refresh with people and activities that feel good. Change directions courageously and as needed. If your plan is not working, update it, tweak it slightly, find another way and keep going. Taking care of yourself all along. Value your life, celebrate that it matters. Who are we? Where are we, are, where are we right now? Where are we going? How do we get there? There are times when we will not be accomplishing as much, okay? It may be uneasy to think clearly. We may lose focus easily. These are lows. The opposition, uh, the opposite happens. We could be excited, inspired, driven, accomplish more evenly. These are the highs. And then there's what I like to call the process. We're not high or low, but steady. We're keeping our daily routine. We're involved. Nothing distracts or disturbs our progress. So now we finally come through your diligence and patience to the audience participation. <laughs> so I'm gonna throw out some questions and I need everybody to be like really vocal about a few terms or ideas that you wanna throw out into the conversation. So I'm gonna need your help. So stand up or raise your hand or just really shout beyond your masks and let me know how are, what are ways that we avoid exhaustion? How do we avoid lows? Anybody got anything that, what do we do? What is it? Okay, so she said some people simply ignore their feelings altogether. Does anybody here know what that's like to just be like, I'm not dealing with these feelings today? Anybody? Ignoring feelings altogether? Yeah, I do that. I'm like, feelings, I even actually said this last week when I had something to do. I had a friend pass away and I said, feelings, you stay right here. I was in my living room. You stay right here. Don't move. Don't visit me. I'm not dealing with you until I get home. And then I went and packed up um, a very dear friend's apartment because they had passed away. But I didn't mess with them. I told them to stay where they were. So that's a good one. Anybody else? Ways we, um, ways that we, um, what do we do to avoid exhaustion? Oh, you stay busy. She said, I keep myself busy. I do that too. When I get tired of reading something that I have a deadline on, I will write something, a project. Oh, let me go, let me finish that email. Let me do these dishes. I will do anything not to be in that still space. I do that as well. I saw your hand. Oh, knowing your limits. Anybody else? Know your limits. I have one that does that. Anybody else? Show hands. Anybody do the know your limits thing? I do. Okay. I know my business partner, Walker, I will tell him my brain turned off and he'll tell me something important and I'll say, no, 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 my man. Did you? Oh, he's like, oh yeah, your brain turns off. I'm like, yep. And we know that about each other. At this time, when she says this phrase, my brain turned off, that means that I have, I have come across my limit. I know my brain isn't absorbing anything else. Anybody? I saw a hand over here. L loud and proud. What did she? What she say? Oh, venting. I'm glad you said that. To avoid exhaustion, get it all out. Dump it all out. Just dump it all out. You know, yeah. So when I get somebody asks me how I, and says, so how are you? I'm fine. Just vent it, vent it, vent it, vent it. Dump it all out. That's the one that I do. I do that. That's the one I'm discouraged. That's the one I'm encouraging. Now I vent in my book. I vent in my book because I don't want to waste it. I don't want it out in the air. I don't want anybody else using it. I vent and I say to myself, I'm going to keep on venting and I'm going to turn this into a product or a project or something that I give back. But yeah, venting, it happens and it's real and I do it. Oh, thank you. None of us here would ever forget to pray, right? That is definitely a way to avoid exhaustion. You got one more? Oh yeah, naps are always a good refresh. So don't get too angry, don't get too hungry, take a nap. So here I have get good rest, keep good company, 
You know, don't be around that person that's always, after a while, be like, oh, I've known them for 15 years. And for 15 years, they've been riding your ear about some stuff that ain't changed. You know, keep good company. Address things as they come up. That's the other one. Um, how do we keep ourselves invigorated? What do we do for the highs? Anybody? Nobody has anything? Okay. Oh, no matter what, celebrate no matter what. I, I made a decision. I'm, I'm going to feel good today. That's my decision. Anybody? Doing things that you enjoy. Okay, so um, I know I'm probably over time, <laughs> but it's just kind of how I am. But um, uh, I put on here, walk more, play basketball, play with younger people, stay up on current events. Anybody? Have, okay, so the last one I'm going to do, and then I know we have the SGA is going to come and get some question and answer. Um, how do we create tension-free zones? This is a really big one. Set healthy boundaries. Leave them where they're at. Leave them where they're at. Hey, you want to do this or this or that? Or I thought we could talk about this. No, I'm going to just leave you where you're at. I'm going to walk away. Yeah? Yeah, preserve your energy. Remind myself, okay, I'm going to keep this to me, you know? I'm going to keep this. This is mine. I'm going to use this for myself. Um, yeah, those are all good. Daily self-routine, daily self-care routines. I love boundaries. Add more joyful experiences. Black joy. Make it happen. Um, I know the light's flicking. I can see it. I got the light. <laughs> um, yeah, so who is the student government associate who's going to help with the... Check... I think we have some questions from the comment cards. Did you guys? Or? What we're going to do is they can raise their hands and then okay, we're going to go cool. to the The questions are like referring to her if y'all have questions for Use the mic. Ms. Chappelle. Oh, the questions are if you have questions for Ms. Chappelle. I'm sorry. If there's anybody that, okay. Can y'all hear me? Ooh, yeah. That's loud. I can hear you now. So I'm a Hodge. I'm currently a graduating senior. I'm from Detroit. So my question to you is I read that you're an advocate for mental and emotional health. How how effective do you advocate? Like what are your most effective ways, if that makes sense? Okay, the most effective tools that I have for advocacy. Yeah. Um, I'll say briefly, like I was a single stay-at-home mom for maybe uh a de two almost two decades. So the most effective thing I did was stop pretending that my voice was not going to be needed in this, in, this, in this conversation. So I had to find my voice. I had to dust off my skills. I had to reinvigorate and re-envision what I wanted my future decades to look like. And that's been one of my strong advocacies. And I really believe that the more, you, the more an individual focuses on themselves and becoming more of who they're meant to be, that is, I literally believe, the most effective medicine for now. Because we all have ideas, thoughts, and feelings about the world we're in, but unless we have a voice or enter into a dialogue or take action, then there is no movement in where we are. So in terms of like um, structures and, and specific resources, I don't have any to offer, but I can tell you if you don't show up for the moment in time that became your entire life and she doesn't show up and she doesn't show up and this elder doesn't show up and this youngster doesn't show up. That is less of what we need. And if we do show up, that's more of what we need. Does that help answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Morgan George. I'm Ms. Wilberforce. Um, my question is, you seem like a very headstrong individual. In the workplace where you come in contact with people that are difficult or don't have the same mindset as you, what tips do you have for us to use so that we can avoid those tensual situations? That's a very important question. I'm really glad you asked that question. Because that wears us down. So the boundary thing that you said, first of all, that's it. Now, I won't have any power to enforce my boundary, but I can know what it is. Right. And the, the woman in the piece that I tried to begin, this man enters her cubicle, standing behind her chair, reading over her shoulder. And the last line of that piece is, each one of these things is individually wrong. Mm -hmm. That this colleague is responding to her in this way. I never give myself to people. So when someone pisses me off, 
I have family members who will be like, oh, okay, she's quiet. So you, you know what's going <laughs> I do not give myself. I check myself. I walk away and I, and I search for the alpha inside. I say, where's the alpha? I know I want the alpha. Where is it? Because to engage is a joy. Look, I fuck. I, ooh. <laughs> See, I have a lot of anger. That's why I like to stick the script. But uh, my bad. Please forgive me. Ooh, my ancestors are here too. I am in trouble. Okay, anyway, um, I, I, I just have to say that, you know, people will test me and I will stand in my power and I won't engage. I will say, oh, they're trying to enrage me because that is the objective of the empty spirit. The objective is to destabilize me. So I'll take it at home. I always remember, don't respond to that now. Don't respond to that now. That's the first one. Don't respond now. And then I go home and I meditate. Where's the alpha? Where's the alpha move? How do I show I am boss? Like I'm, a, you know, like you said, I'm headstrong. So I have to have that alpha. I'm hungry for it. And I don't give them anything. I'd say, say, oh, you know, I noticed here, I noticed here in this report that you prepared that um, despite a bunch of spelling errors, you know, the idea basically looks good or whatever it is that might get said. And I'll be like, thank you. And that's not what I feel at all. Yes. And I walk away and I say to myself, where is the alpha? Where? And I wake up with the alpha. I pray over it. And I, and I, did, and I go in there and I. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Smack them with that alpha. <laughs> uh, can I go real quick? Um, one of the questions that I prepared yesterday, my first time speaking to you, I read over, you gave me the website that you have, um, the Women Work Wonders. When you are doing the 10 minute flash, what is something that you feeling about like in between those intervals? Because you create the story and the scenery for us to like feel and relax. But what's those, what's some of the things that you feel no. during that moment? That's a really good question too. Uh, for Faces on the Train, which for anybody, check it out, it's online. Um, I do these pieces that I call audio drama flash fiction. Flash fiction is when you tell a story like this. Boom, boom, quick story, in and out. The whole thing happens in a moment. Um, and you're asking me what are my thoughts and feelings? Well, you know, actually I started, I started Faces on the Train when it was the depth of COVID and I actually recorded it in my walk-in closet. I put towels under the door. I had to record after everybody settled down and before the birds started to chirp. That was my window of opportunity to get my work done. And um, cause there was no studio opportunity. And um, one of the things that I was feeling is, is like these chance interactions, kind of how the previous question was presented to me about workspace interactions. These chance interactions, we only have one time to get it right. One time to erase something we wish we hadn't said. One time to approach something in a way, you only get one time to get it right, like a first impression. So one of the things that I'm feeling when I'm creating the characters and faces on the train is, you never know what someone is dealing with. You just don't know. So I might see, somebody might cut me off and I might in my mind have a really aggressive response. So now my blood chemistry is all off. They've cut me off and then I might react. I might do something, I might lean out the window and be like ah, ah, and make some faces or whatever. And this thing has happened already, right? I might come to find out later they're rushing to the hospital for a loved one about to take a last breath. I don't know what's going on with them. All I, so I do things like tell myself, I know I've probably cut someone off before and I let it go. And Faces on the Train is all about those moments and how we can write them to create positivity instead of imagining the worst or instead of allowing conflict to be the dominant force of a response in a social action. Boom, flash. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Let me hear from you. I'm sorry, Alex, I'm sorry. No, you're good, you can go. Okay, when it comes to setting boundaries, when you're searching for that alpha response, yeah. how do you express to the people that you're setting the boundaries with, how do you express that to them in a good like in a good way? Effective communication and expressing a boundary to someone who has overstepped it? I don't. I don't express it to them. That's the answer, I don't. I say, oh, thanks for that input. I'm glad you came through with that. And I walk away and I think, How's, where's the alpha? It's gonna come, cause I'm gonna pray over it. Or I'm gonna reflect on it or I'm gonna find it. But I don't always express that boundary at all. I often don't. Unless it's an intimate relationship, a friend, a, a, a somebody, a lo you know, but in a professional setting, I don't. I remind myself, this is a person who doesn't have the intelligence not to have already made that mistake. So I am not gonna engage with this person because they have already let me know that they are functioning in inferiority. They have already let me know that they are going to have to be a subordinate to my next idea. 
That's the only way I can survive. I don't know another way to survive. It's a little too um, arrogant. So you have, you know, I always have to check my energy when it flows in that way. But I, I, once that happens, I just say, you know, I leave them in that. Let them, who said that? Let them, let them be where they are. And I do not let that boundary be known. And I find out what the alpha move is. And then I implement a strategy because I am not going to be reacting and reacting and reacting because I am a volatile element on the periodic table. I'm in that volatile section of element. So I already know myself about that. And I don't. I just don't. Just be like, oh, they think I'm, uh, they, you know, I'm coming in under. They don't anticipate that I have power. They don't anticipate that I have strength. They don't anticipate that I have intelligence. That's okay. I'm not going to engage with that. And then I scoot home and I cry and I lick my wounds and I pout by myself in the privacy of my own internal spaces. And then I find that alpha move and I go back and I smack it on them. But I don't say anything out loud. I am Alexander Murphy. So first off, let me say thank you for coming to speak to us today. It was a very informative and insightful lecture. Thank you for that. It was wonderful. And my question to you is, <laughs> Thanks. Yay. and my question to you is, I've noticed several times today you've mentioned how you get emotional and how angry you be sometimes and are so did that play a role in you becoming an advocate in the things that you advocate for, or was that just part of the process? Oh, that's an excellent question. Wow. I actually, I'm going to ask that question to myself tonight when I'm by myself, but let me think, did it become, did, am I naturally angry? It was a part of the process because I'm generally very mild spirited. That's my nature. So my nature is a diminutive. I'm a very, but when I was like, oh, if I don't say something, nothing's going to change. And then I became more and more vocal. And I became clear about what my no's were. Then I became clear about what boundaries I was going to fight, what battles I would fight, and what batteries I And then I just thought, you know what? We all deserve a little more from what life has to offer. So let me just be kind. You know, killed my own mean-spiritedness and tried to, tried to. and I, I know I talked to one, I know a friend of mine at Pixar who was a storyteller for that company said, you know, we just keep the darkness inside and we just deliver the gems. And that's kind of what I do. And I always visit that person or other people in my memory when I'm trying to when I'm trying to keep that alive for myself, to only deliver the gems, you know. Anybody else? I have a question. Okay. What keeps you motivated? <laughs> what keeps me? Mo I'm not always motivated. Discipline. I am not motivated. Motivation is a fantasy. You do not wait for motivation. If you wait for motivation, you will never accomplish. Discipline is what the tool is that I use to get up every day. Motivation, eh. Motivation is a, is a very um, indecisive part of my spirit. You know, motivation, ah, if I waited for motivation, nothing would happen. I'm not a very motivated individual. I'm like, oh, racism, social justice, advocacy, and to-do list again today. And I march, but I'm not motivated. I have discipline. Discipline with art, discipline with science, discipline with education. Discipline with daily life, discipline with self-care, it's all, it, discipline is a big deal. Uh, I don't know anything about motivation. <laughs> I don't. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Kimberly Porter. Thank you. I want sorry about that. So once again, thank you so much, Ms. Chappelle, for coming to talk to all of us. Um, as um, we said, I am Dr. Kimberly Porter. I am a very proud alum of Wilberforce University, class of 1985. So I am honored to be here every day and to be before all of you. And um, to give closing remarks, so again, I wanted to thank you so much for coming. Thank all of you for coming out. Um, and to a, a very, very heartfelt thank you to our sponsor, Dominion Energy, for bringing this series. And to the community and everyone else, our faculty and staff who have been here. So again, we do have one more lecture series coming up in April, and we will be giving um, some more information about that. So everyone, please uh, keep on the lookout for it. 
and we will get all that information out to you. So I believe we have a presentation. Thank you, Dr. Porter. We just wanted to thank you all so much, Mr. McCoy, Ms. Chappelle, Mrs. Chappelle, we are so glad that you all are back home, back into the Wilberforce family. Thank you for your words of advice. Thank you for your generous support. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do. Thank you. So God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I am so touched. Wow. I was not expecting that. All right, and with that, I believe Reverend Freeman, is Reverend Freeman with us? Yeah. <laughs> will give us our benediction and then lead us in the uh, alma mater as well. And if you all keep your masks on, we will touch and do the alma mater because we heard that students were so excited to have that back. So just keep your masks high, okay? And that way we can, we can do our famous alma mater. Thank you, Reverend Freeman. I know that you think like I do. That's great. I, I was thinking the day I came over and I rehearsed, I said, everybody do not know how to sing it fluently. And we have some alums also on the uh, uh, gathering today by virtually. So we're going to go ahead with the uh, alma mater. And uh, so we're going to do it this way. Glorious to view. Stand our noble alma mater, D-O-W-U. Swear the chorus ever on to gold and green be true. Hail to thee, our alma mater, D-O-W-U Men and maidens throng the campus From all states they come And from all the rowing watches To this common home Swear the chorus ever on to gold and green be true. Hail to thee, our alma mater, D O W U. Amen. Amen. What we had was the Wilberforce University Alumni National Chapter that was singing it also. So uh, I thought about that yesterday. My grandson was telling me was on the way back. He said, Bobo, just use, use your, your telephone. All right. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our speaker. We thank you for the energy, the excitement, and all the encouragement and the challenges that she brought forth. God, we pray that all who were in attendance and listening, that something was said that will help make all of us a better individual than we were when we came. Bless us now in your name. Amen. Face. There was a word 
I would have said, but what it was I hardly know. I let the days glide by and long.